Hello everyone, it's Mark Godaker here. Welcome to the NT Pod, the podcast all about the New Testament and Christian origins. It's episode 53 and today we're asking, are the passion narratives prophecy historicised? Even the most casual reader of the Gospels can't help but notice that the passion narratives are full of quotations from the Old Testament, and not just quotations, allusions, and just evoking the atmosphere of the Old Testament lots of the time. I'm going to use the phrase Old Testament in this podcast, even though perhaps more correctly we should say Hebrew Bible or even Greek Bible, because lots of the time they're working from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, the Septuagint. But say Old Testament is the more familiar term, and lots of people will know what I'm talking about when I say that. But of course, there is a danger when you say Old Testament that straight away we we kind of begin to imagine that there already is a New Testament when the evangelists are writing, which of course there isn't. But anyway, that little thing to one side. All the time you keep seeing these quotations, these allusions to Old Testament texts. I mean, just think of Psalm 22, for example. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It begins. And these are famously the last words of Jesus on the cross in both Mark and Matthew. But Psalm 22 isn't just something that Jesus quotes while he's on the cross, but also it's something that the actors in the drama themselves seem to be inadvertently fulfilling. So in Psalm 22, 7, when you get the line, all who see me mock me, they shake their heads. This corresponds quite closely to the way that in Mark 15, you have the chief priests along with the scribes mocking him and those who pass by deriding him, shaking their heads. Or you have in Psalm 22, 18, they divided my garments among them and for my raiment they cast lots. And then Mark 15, 24 parallels this with they divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide which each should take. So you have all sorts of little quotations, allusions to the Old Testament. Now, you have those throughout the Gospels. The Passion narrative isn't special or unique in that respect, but there is a heightened number of these. There is, there's a really concentrated amount of Old Testament quotation in the Passion Narratives in particular. If you've got one of those Bibles that puts Old Testament quotations in bold type or in italics, you'll see more and more of it. Or if you've got one of those Bibles where it's got all of the Old Testament allusions, citations and so on in the margins, the margins are crowded when you get to the Passion Narratives. So so why is this the case? Why is it that the Passion Narratives are so full of all of this material? Well, to some extent, the answer is a theological one, because the evangelists are trying to show that Jesus is fulfilling scripture and that Jesus's death fulfills scripture. Remember that one of the very earliest Christian confessions, which you find in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, states that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So that phrase, according to the scriptures, is already there in the thinking of the earliest Christians. And one of the things they're trying to do theologically is they're trying to show that Jesus fulfills that, that that Jesus's passion isn't just some horrible accident, some awful mistake. Actually, it's something that really fulfills God's plan for Jesus and for humankind. So Obviously, that key point is there, and you can see this in the text itself. Mark 14 has Jesus saying, For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Or you have in Mark 14, 49, Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled, Jesus says. But all of this raises an interesting historical question, and it's one that New Testament scholars have been quick to pick up on, because... If you've got this early Christian belief that Jesus died in accordance with the scriptures, if you believe that the Old Testament tell Jesus' story, could it be that the early Christians actually went to the Old Testament to find out what Jesus' story was? In other words, could it be that where they were lacking information about Jesus, where they were lacking information about the Passion narrative, that they would go searching the scriptures to find out what Jesus had done, as it were. In other words, that they took Old Testament prophecy and historicized it. Now, this view, which has got some pedigree in New Testament scholarship, is especially associated these days with a scholar called John Dominic Crossan. 
And Crossan thinks that the evangelists didn't really know much in the way of actual nuggets of history about what happened to Jesus. They knew that he'd been crucified. They knew the absolute basics, like he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. But he thinks they didn't really have any actual detail, no plot, no structure, nothing to build around that central fact. So what he thinks happened is they went searching in the scriptures to fill out that story. And he uses this term prophecy historicized to kind of explain what that. So when he looks at those Psalm 22 verses that we were alluding to earlier on, he says that what Mark or the people that were feeding into Mark's gospel were doing is they actually went to Psalm 22, saw it as prophesying the passion, and in seeing it prophesying the passion, they then wrote the story of Jesus's passion in the light of Psalm 22. They didn't know that Jesus had said these things, they just pulled them out of Psalm 22 in the in the belief that somehow they were prophesying what would actually happen to Jesus. Crossan contrasts his own view with the scholarship of Raymond Brown, the late Raymond Brown, who Crossan says has a belief in history remembered. He thinks that Raymond Brown just sees the passion narratives as being built up from the evangelists remembering history. They saw things the earliest Christians did. They passed them on in tradition and as time went on these things crystallized into the gospel stories. So for someone like Raymond Brown according to Crossan the passion narrative is a history remembered. So he sets this whole contrast up. Are they history remembered or are they prophecy historicized? Now I'm a great admirer of the scholarship of John Dominic Crossan. He's a gifted orator and a great teacher and he's also a really good writer and he always stimulates me to think. But I think he's actually not right about this one, about prophecy historicized, and I'll try and explain why in a few steps. Let me explain something that often happens in New Testament scholarship, though, which is that if you want to be truly successful in getting a thesis over, you have to find a natty little phrase to put it in. And I think the mark of Crossan's genius is that he was able to think of this phrase prophecy historicized which is easy to understand and which you can pick up and 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 apply to the gospels and you really know what's going on and when i began to develop some of my own ideas on the passion narrative in contradistinction to crossan's ideas i decided that i needed my own particular phrase as well and luckily i found that there was already a phrase out there in the scholarship of judith newman that talks about scripturalization it's a bit of a long and cumbersome sort of phrase but I rather like it and so I contrast my own view with Crossan's by using Newman's word scripturalization. And what I think happened is this, I think the earliest Christians who had that strong belief in the authority of the Old Testament and who were trying to tell the story of Jesus's passion with the conviction that it fulfilled the Old Testament, they couldn't help themselves but describe the events in terms of those Old Testament texts. So if you like, they had the tradition, but they were scripturalizing all the time. So instead of saying that Jesus was crucified naked on the cross, they used the Psalm 22 verse about the casting lots for Jesus's clothing. They think in those scriptural terms. Instead of just saying that people, when they passed by, derided him, they add shaking their heads because those words of Psalm 22 are resonating, they're ringing in their ears. It's a little bit like if you know a Christian who writes their emails or writes their letters and fills them with scriptural language themselves and perhaps says, my dear brothers and sisters who are living in the town of Burton-on-Trent or whatever. If you have someone saying that, what they're really doing themselves is a modern form of scripturalizing. And I think that's what's going on in the evangelists. I think that they are scripturalizing, their, 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 their heads are moving so much in those Old Testament scriptures that what they do is they can't help but tell the story using that language, using that imagery. It just comes to the forefront of their mind all the time. The, the difficult thing, of course, about this is that it makes doing history very difficult because it's difficult to disentangle tradition and history. If right from the very beginning you have people 
telling the story using scriptural themes and languages and so on, then it becomes very difficult to disentangle a kind of pure historical unvarnished core from the scriptural adornments that it's got. And I think that's why probably we should think in terms not of a kind of core in the middle and then a kind of scripturalizing varnish on the outside. Rather, I think probably what we should think of is a kind of dynamic interaction between the two. The two things are working together at all times, tradition mixing with scripture, scripture mixing with tradition. But I mean, how do we know who's right about this? I mean, is cross and right that we should be thinking in terms of prophecy historicized, or am I right that we should be thinking in terms of history scripturalized? Well, I think the advantage of my view over his is that when you look at the passion narrative itself, all sorts of the details that you see there don't have a kind of scriptural warrant to them. Think of these named characters like Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus in Mark 15, or the women at the end of the story in the burial and the crucifixion and the resurrection accounts. Those women again, look like they're not derived from scriptural warrants. So I think that that nudges things more in my direction, if I might be so bold. And at the same time, I think there's an internal contradiction going on in some of Croissant's work, because he says that nobody knew what had happened because the male disciples had all fled. They're all gone, they're all fled. And the only reason we even know about the crucifixion itself is because women witnessed crucifixion from afar off and, and, and that's how we know that he was crucified rather than speared or beheaded or something like that. But the thing is that, how does Crossan know that the male disciples had all fled? He knows that the male disciples had all fled because it says so in Mark's text. But then in Mark's text, when it says that the male disciples had all fled, this is given as a scriptural fulfillment. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And so one of the premises for Crossan's whole idea, that the male disciples weren't there and therefore lots of people didn't know what had happened, is actually something that really on his scheme we should be thinking of as a scripture that is a prophecy historicized. So I think there's an internal contradiction there. I think there's a problem with the coherence of the theory. And I think the idea instead of tradition mixing with scripture, scripturalizing of tradition, is the one that makes better sense of the origins of the passion narrative. And that's just a brief sketch of how I see the passion narrative working. Since Usually at this time of year I do a little bit on the Passion Narratives and the Gospels. I hope next time to have a little bit more and perhaps we'll take some of the insights from today and apply them next time too. But I hope you've enjoyed listening to this, the latest episode of the MT Pod. It's always good to have your company. You can find me on the web at podacre.blogspot.com. I'm on iTunes or Duke University's iTunes U and uh, or look me up on uh, Facebook, facebook.com slash ntpod. Thanks again for your company. Look forward to being with you again soon. Bye-bye.